Or maybe do bad Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Wenbo Zhang, and I'd like to welcome you on behalf of the ACS to this panel discussion on gun control. I'll keep my intro short so we can all get to listen to our wonderful panelists. Let's first welcome Professor Joseph Loker, who will be moderating today. His principal academic interests include federal and state constitutional law, the First and Second Amendments, capital punishment, and the property. And let's also welcome Professor Daryl Miller, another great professor here at Duke Law and also a distinguished Second Amendment scholar. He focuses his scholarship and teaching on issues concerning civil rights, constitutional law, civil procedure, state and local government law, and legal history. Today we will also hear from Professor Jeffrey Swanson, a professor in psychiatry and behavioral sciences at Duke University School of Medicine. Dr. Swanson is the author or co-author of over 200 publications, including topics on the epidemiology of violence and serious mental illness, illness and laws and policies to reduce firearm violence. And last but not least, we have Professor Jeffrey Welty from the UNC School of Government. Professor Welty is an associate professor of public law and government and the, the director of the North Carolina Judicial College. He is a Duke Law grad, and he also taught here as a lecturing fellow for a while. His primary academic interest is in criminal law and the procedure, and he writes about issues related to gun control in a blog called NC Criminal Law. Now let's hear from our panelists. Uh, <clears throat> thanks uh, very much to all of you, and special thanks to Wimbo, who really put a lot of work into bringing this event together. It's really um, a great opportunity for us to get to talk to one another, and to talk to you all about some really important interests uh, and issues involving uh, gun rights and gun regulation. I um, also want to extend a special thanks to ACS for putting on this event. Um, if you guys have been following the event calendar, you know ACS has been putting on a lot of cool events. If you're interested in the organization, please do reach out and join. Um, Professor Siegel and I are the um, co-faculty advisors and have been lucky enough to be involved for the last few years. Love to have more of you. Um, I've been asked to just sort of set the table and give you a, just a general doctrinal snapshot of the Second Amendment component of what's going on here. So I'll do that very briefly and then pass things sort of down the line. Um, the place to start, of course, the Second Amendment doctrine is District of Columbia v. Heller, um, but I'm not going to talk much about it because I think at least two-thirds of you, anybody who's 1L or 2L anyway has had this from me already in foundations or probably also in your con law courses. And anyway, you're probably familiar with the basic holding of Heller, which is that the Second Amendment protects the so-called individual right to keep and bear arms independent of malicious service, that the core of that right has something to do with self-defense, presumably uh, uh, in the home. But I do want to emphasize something else from Heller, um, which should be obvious to all of you having been in law school now, but um, Fortunately, it's not always obvious to people who are talking about the Second Amendment and gun control, which is that Heller does not say in any way, shape, or form that gun control is categorically unconstitutional. And that's, of course, just a platitude for those of us who are trained in law. But if you follow the debates, you'll hear people say things like, I oppose gun control because I support the Second Amendment, right, or vice versa, right? And that's just a false choice. It's a false dichotomy that if, if there's anything else you take away from the doctrine, you should take that away, that the Second Amendment, like all other amendments, like all other constitutional rights, is subject to regulation. And in fact, we know that from Heller, because Heller, having recognized this right, then goes on to say in a passage which you may have encountered, that nothing in our opinion should be taken to cast doubt on longstanding prohibitions of possession of guns by felons and the mentally ill, or carrying of dangerous and unusual weapons, or possession of guns in dangerous in sensitive places like schools uh, and government buildings and so on. So Heller tells us that gun control can be constitutional even if there is this individual right. What Heller does not give us, however, is the sort of familiar standard of review that you guys have probably encountered in con law. It doesn't say you should apply strict scrutiny or intermediate scrutiny or rational basis review. It just kind of takes certain things off the table and then leaves the rest of it to be filled in. So I thought what I'd do is just give you a very quick overview of what is happening with the doctrine and how it's actually being filled in mostly the courts of appeal, because as you know, the, court has, the Supreme Court has only taken one more Second Amendment case, uh, which is the McDonald case, in which it incorporated Heller against the states and local governments. Well, what's happening at the courts of appeals um, uh, is we're seeing the development of what could basically be understood as a two-part test. Um, and the first part of this test uh, 
sort of a threshold inquiry that asks whether a particular kind of gun control law, gun regulation, infringes on activity that has anything to do with the Second Amendment. And that actually is a question with bite, because there are some kinds of guns and some kinds of people and some kinds of gun-related activities that simply do not fall within the scope of the Second Amendment. So for example, if you are a felon, or if you're trying to possess a nuclear weapon, or if you are trying to carry your weapon concealed, it seems, you just don't have any Second Amendment right. Not a, not a question of whether the scrutiny needs to be satisfied. It just doesn't get triggered. Sort of the equivalent that we say that securities fraud or child pornography don't count as speech for the purposes of the First Amendment, even if they involve the transmission of meaning through words. Just like that, there are certain gun-related activities that just don't touch the Second Amendment. Now, how do we figure out what those are? Well, it's a little hard to say, but I would say that the test is heavily historical, um, that courts tend to look back in history, back in time, not necessarily to the founding, but backwards, to say, look, is this the kind of activity that was recognized as being within the Second Amendment? Is this the kind of regulation that the Second Amendment was thought to tolerate? very difficult to generalize about that history, so I won't attempt it. Um, uh, it always matters whose history, how much, what you have to show. But I'll offer one slightly opinionated observation here, which is that supporters of reasonable gun regulation, I think, too quickly run away from the history. And they don't realize how much of it is on their side. So people tend to think that gun control is this brand new thing cooked up by contemporary liberals. And it is not. Uh, American history is full of gun control that would make the modern Brady Center blush. We had full-time uh, bans on gun possession in these famous supposed gun havens like Dodge City and Tombstone, Arizona. We had uh, licensing restrictions, safe storage requirements, the kinds of things that people like um, every town for gun safety are pushing for today. And we've had them throughout American history. So we have a history and a culture of guns. We also have a history and a culture of gun regulation. Anyway, that's step one, the threshold inquiry very heavily inflected by history. Step two is, if you get through that threshold and you've shown that this regulation impinges on activity protected by the Second Amendment, then you must apply some level of what looks like scrutiny. Now, as I say, courts have not identified what the level of scrutiny is. There's some dispute about this. Big case from the Fourth Circuit two weeks ago, which applied strict scrutiny to a particular kind of restriction. But for the most part, courts are doing something that looks and sounds a lot like intermediate scrutiny, which you guys have met in con law before. Um, uh, the best way to understand it, I think, is something like a sliding scale, like the more the burden is on protected conduct, particularly that core protected conduct of self-defense in the home, the higher the government interest has to be and the better tailored the law has to be to further it. Now, there is rarely any question about whether the government has a sufficient interest in these cases, because the government's interest is certainly important, obviously legitimate, and almost all cases compelling, because what the government is trying to do with gun regulation is save lives save some of the 30,000 or so gun deaths every year, about half or two-thirds of which are suicides. If you include just not just deaths, but casualties, people injured, you're looking at more like 100,000. That certainly gives rise to a legitimate, I think important, and arguably compelling government interest. The debate is usually about the tailoring prong, whether a particular gun law actually serves the government interest. And there, it's very hard to generalize, because there's lots of different kinds of gun law, and there's a lot of dispute about what works. And I would say the evidence is more mixed than people on either side would like to admit. Um, but generally, in applying that kind of tailoring analysis, courts defer to the political branches. So those of you who are in favor of courts of limited role and you're against judicial activism, you should be happy about this. This is courts saying we can't judge these um, you know, expert determinations. We'll leave that to the political branch. They can fix it if they want to. Um, uh, and on that note of deference, maybe, and having used about seven minutes here, let me defer to my co-panelists and I'm happy to answer more questions. Thanks, Joseph. Um, and again, thanks for coming out. So my remarks are going to um, be somewhat familiar for those of you that uh, came out to the debate that I had with Clayton Kramer here last year. Uh, if you're a 2 or 3L, you are 2L. You might have seen that. If you're 1L, uh, you might have seen it online. But um, I think one of the really interesting and un explored areas about um, gun policy, uh, gun control, gun rights, is the intersection of that with issues of race. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I want to sort of explore that a little bit in my uh, my brief remarks. Um, um, 
you know, this is an extremely tense topic, and um, the reason is is because I think if you look at the sort of political discourse, uh, both gun rights advocates and gun control advocates uh, kind of want to use race and uh, the alleged racism of um, gun control uh, or gun rights as a way of um, showing that their position is the morally superior one and the other position is, uh, in some sense, morally bankrupt. Um, and I think it's important to sort of think through some some facts when we talk about that. So without question, the legal history uh, uh, in this country of guns, uh, just like any other issue, uh, is deeply entangled with questions of race. So uh, in the 17th century, um, you know, before um, we even have Jefferson et al., you know, when we still have um, you know, pre Puritans and um, second uh, second sons coming to Jamestown to try to make their fortunes, um, the issue of guns and race are intertwined and usually around the idea of um, whether Native Americans uh, or Indians uh, can uh, uh, have them. Uh, so laws in, uh, in New England and Connecticut would outlaw the selling of guns, powder, and ammunition to Indians or even the repair of such weapons if um, somebody came to, uh, to seek a repair of a flintlock or, or whatever kind of weapon was available. Um, then, of course, um, with uh, 1619 or thereabouts, when we uh, start talking about the introduction of uh, Africans to the American continent, um, the question about slavery and race, uh, in particular with African Americans, becomes salient. Uh, and so Georgia had a statute that required a slave either to be in the presence of a master or have a special ticket from the master uh, or license um, uh, to uh, carry an arm. Uh, New Jersey and New York, uh, before uh, they abolished slavery, had their own similar regulations. Um, these types of regulations um, basically translate and transmit uh, forward into the 18th and 19th century. Uh, so right here in North Carolina, uh, uh, North Carolina had a regulation that said, quote, if any free Negro, mulatto, or free person of color shall wear or carry about his or her person or keep in his or her house any shotgun, musket, rifle, pistol, sword, dagger, or bowie knife, uh, um, unless he or she shall have obtained a license, therefore, from the court of pleas and quarter sessions of his or her county, um, he shall be guilty of a misdemeanor and be indicted, therefore. Missouri and Texas and other states had similar uh, such regulations. Um, so, you know, when we um, talk about the history of uh, gun rights and gun regulations, uh, we're really talking about the relations of uh, people of different races in the, in the United States. Um, and so it's undeniable uh, that uh, the history of gun uh, laws in, in America are, are um, deeply enmeshed with questions of race, and in particular show that there was some sense of trying to keep uh, firearms from people that by their very uh, designation as others were thought to be um, not virtuous or without virtue or unable to have uh, be part of the uh, citizenry. Um, and so gun uh, rights advocates uh, tend to point to these regulations and say, yeah, and that's why any licensing regime, uh, no matter how historical, as uh, Professor Bloker has just said, uh, need to be uh, looked upon with some sort of scrutiny, or at least they're constitutionally suspect. And it's no accident that the Marquis case, uh, which asks the question about whether or not um, gun rights uh, or the Second Amendment applies to the states, uh, is brought by Otis McDonald, a 75-year-old uh, African-American man who was the uh, son of Louisiana sharecroppers and moved to Chicago as part of the Great Migration. You know, talk about uh, sort of a marquee, uh, a marquee plaintiff. Uh, there you have it. Uh, but I think that um, that sort of focus of saying, uh, you know, therefore, uh, because gun regulations in the past were inflected with race, uh, they are necessarily wrong or bad, I think, uh, proves too much. Uh, as I said, when uh, Mr. Kramer was here uh, last year, everything was racist, right? I mean, that's, that was the society, whether we're talking about contract law or who could, uh, you know, who could own something or who, who could own somebody, property law, tort law. Um, it was all uh, sort of inflected with uh, issues of race. Um, 
And so to simply say that uh, because you have one instance of that, the entire architecture of gun regulations is therefore suspect, I think proves too much. Um, and it doesn't take into account uh, what um, Professor Bloker has quite rightly identified as a fairly thoroughgoing regulation uh, of guns and uh, various dynamics that weren't necessarily uh, racially tied, or at least not expressly so. Um, it seems to me that I think it's fair to say that, um, yes, even though gun regulation in the past is, is, uh, has been racist, so has the lack of gun regulation. Um, and uh, that sort of idea of a, a, a liberty um, to uh, carry weapons uh, has itself been uh, part of um, a, a history of white supremacy and racism in America as well. So when the Ku Klux Klan uh, is um, uh, going about and um, harassing freedmen um, and doing more than harassing freedmen in South Carolina in uh, the uh, 1870s, uh, they are simply saying that they are doing uh, it as part of a traditional policing function that essentially the right to uh, arm yourself and police the neighborhood publicly with weapons is something that has simply been a function of uh, the community from time immemorial. And the fact that they're deploying this kind of behavior in a, uh, a um, racially discriminatory way is just incidental. Uh, in fact, one of the huge issues um, during um, uh, what became known as the Ku Klux Klan trials uh, was the sense that um, the actual designated uh, police uh, force, in some sense, the militia, had become overwhelmingly black uh, because it was mostly um, Republican, um, uh, a Republican and sort of pro, uh, a, a pro North, pro freedmen organization. Uh, and because it had become sort of racially uh, balkanized as an organization, uh, one of the arguments that the um, uh, the Klan made was that, look, they get uh, these great guns, and uh, we don't get these great guns, um, and what else would we do but go out and disarm the people who are actually the designated representatives of, uh, of um, what they thought as uh, simply a partisan, uh, a partisan um, organization. Um, uh, General Gordon, when called to testify before Congress, called the Klan this, uh, quote, uh, nothing more, nothing less, an organization, a brotherhood of the property holders, the peaceable, law-abiding citizens of the state for self-protection. So I think it's fair to say that, you know, race is all around. Um, the real question is how do you sort of connect that to modern or um, uh, contemporary attitudes uh, towards gun control, I think, that have these sort of intersections with race. So um, although the cases that tend to galvanize uh, public attention uh, are, you know, mass shootings of various kinds in schools and on college campuses and these other horrific, horrific events, um, in fact, probably the bulk, uh, I think it's fair to say that the bulk of uh, gun violence is, is sort of not occurring in mass shootings. It is the constant drip, 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 right, of typically young black males uh, being killed um, uh, with firearms. Uh, it is uh, 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 the firearm uh, rates um, in terms of the deaths um, uh, for black males is something like um, 37.16 per 100,000 and significantly higher uh, than any other demographic group. Um, and so... When we think about um, race in particular and, and gun control, um, uh, blacks uh, tend to support gun control by something like a 30 percent margin. Uh, a recent Pew poll said that 82 uh, percent of uh, black respondents to the poll uh, would favor a federal database for gun sales. Uh, and so I think one of the issues that um, we should think about when we think about these sort of intersectionality issues about race uh, and guns in particular is, um, given the history, given what um, Professor Bloker has said about the sort of architecture of a, of a set of doctrinal rules about how to deal with uh, guns uh, and uh, how to scrutinize regulation, where is going to be the space, uh, if in fact we want the space, uh, for a certain amount of self-determination? Uh, for uh, 
inner city uh, people that work in uh, that work and live in cities uh, that tend to be uh, majority minority populations. Um, uh, will the doctrine, as it develops over time, and eventually it'll have to develop over time, um, be able to create a space for some of these preferences, if you want to think of it that way, um, of, um, of, of persons of color um, to express themselves uh, as uh, policy? With that, I'll hand it to Jeff. Great. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for coming. And Wenbo, thanks very much for the invitation to be a part of this important conversation. Um, so sitting here with these three distinguished legal scholars, I feel a little bit like I'm a part of that um, Sesame Street game called Which of These Things is Not Like the Other. Um, so I'm, I'm not a lawyer. And actually, uh, notwithstanding I am a professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences, I'm not a psychiatrist either. I'm not a clinical psychiatrist. You have to say that because sometimes mm -hmm. if people think you are, you get into some really awkward conversations. <laughs> well, what I, what I am, and hopefully what I can bring to this conversation, uh, is I am a sociologist and, and a sort of an applied sociologist who studies problems like uh, mental illness uh, and firearms-related injury and mortality at the population level from a public health perspective and tries to bring um, evidence to bear, research evidence to bear, to these kinds of problems to, to find our way to some uh, interventions and policies and laws that might meaningfully reduce the problem, uh, but do so in a way that uh, will, in this case, balance risk uh, and rights, uh, given that there's a constitutional right at stake. Um, I have um, also um, uh, read the uh, d decision in, um, uh, in the la landmark decision, DC versus uh, Heller, and. Um, as a layperson, I guess, and as a researcher, my favorite word in it is albeit, albeit, <laughs> where it says it, 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 is a, it is a right, it confers an individual right to keep and bear arms, the, the Second Amendment, but it's not uh, an, all, an unlimited right. And so the, that's where I think there is a very, very interesting opportunity for research evidence, because we have to figure out uh, what those limits should be, and I think that um, that uh, science about risk and effectiveness of different kinds of interventions um, has an important uh, role uh, uh, to play there. Um, you know, when you think about the problem in terms of international comparisons, you look at our country compared to um, you know the the countries in Western Europe and and. Uh, the UK and Australia and Japan and Canada, you know, that we like to compare ourselves to, high-income, advanced countries. Um, and, and you look at uh, rates of victimization of crime and violent crime, um, what's really, really remarkable over the past uh, 50 years is we, we, are, are, we don't have an exceptional crime problem. We're just right there in the middle in terms of our rate of crime victimization. But when you look at our country and you compare it to these other countries, in terms of a particular type of crime, homicide, where you have an assault and you have a dead body, there it's very different. Our homicide rate is several times higher than these other countries. So there's this paradox. How can we have a crime rate that's about the same, but far more likely to have homicide? And that has to do with our unique relationship to firearms. Because when th there is an assault in this country, um, just think about it this way, you know, let's say in, in, in London, you know, late at night, there are two angry, uh, impulsive, intoxicated young men and get into a fight, and somebody pulls uh, a, a, their fist out, and someone gets a, a bloody nose or a black eye. In our country, it's a lot more likely that there's going to be uh, a handgun involved and a dead body, and that's embedded in our, in our fatality rates. Now, so the, the problem of gun violence um, from a public health perspective uh, is, uh, is, is very significant. I mean, there's no other source of, of mortality uh, and injury that would not be considered a major public health problem. No other, you know, uh, product also involved in this many, uh, you know, fatalities that wouldn't be considered a public health problem. Um, but that, that's then where, uh, you know, uh, politics gets involved. The circumstances are diverse. Violent behavior, interpersonal violent behavior, is a complex human behavior that, it, that involves many different factors that come together and interact in complex ways. But when do we tend to focus on this? And when does it seep into our national conversation? It's when there is a horrifying mass casualty shooting by a disturbed young man. And then we hear, uh, you know, in the media and prominent voices in the public square tell us, 
the problem here is mental illness. So let's focus on mental illness. Let's reform our mental health care system, and that is going to solve the problem of gun violence. And the problem is that the, the mass shooter, the, the you know, um, mass casualty uh, public shooter goes out and massacres a bunch of strangers <laughs> is really atypical in two ways. Atypical of the people with mental illness, the vast majority of whom are not violent and never will be, and also really atypical of what Professor Miller has called the drip, drip, drip of gun violence. Um, and uh, because the vast majority of the, of the perpetrators of gun violence do not have serious mental illness. So when you kind of reframe it and you think, well, in this balance of risk and rights, let's think about risk and let's try to use risk as a way to think about who are the people who are so dangerous that it is justified to limit their Second Amendment right. Uh, mental illness, serious mental illnesses that impair uh, reasoning and, and uh, perception of reality and mood regulation like schizophrenia and bipolar disorder and depression, it, you know, that's kind of a red herring because even if we magically cured all those mental illnesses, that would be wonderful. Uh, but our violence problem would go down by about 4%, and about 96% of it would still be there because that's the attributable risk. So it's, it, you know, from my point of view, it, you know, it's important to kind of debunk this myth that it's all about mental illness. And if, and if we listen to some of the uh, legislative proposals right now, like Senator Cornyn's proposal, let's reform the mental health care system, Representative Tim Murphy's proposal, let's, uh, you know, expand mental health treatment in the community, and that's going to solve gun violence. Well, it, it probably is not. That might be a distraction to think about mental illness instead of guns. Now, the complicated part of this becomes, from a, the point of view of kind of the psychiatric epidemiology uh, and the public health perspective, is that, as we've heard, two-thirds of the firearm fatalities are suicides. So there it's a different story with respect to mental illness, because mental illness is a very strong causal vector in suicides. And as one of my friends in emergency medicine says, the brain doesn't care who fired the bullet, it's still going to inflict just as much damage. Means restriction is really, really important. It's a public health opportunity is where the law has a role to play in suicides. Because the, if, if someone uh, tries to commit suicide and they use anything but a gun, they're very likely to survive. The case fatality rate is about 10%. And if people do survive suicides, they're unlikely to die from suicide. They're more likely than if they had never tried it before, but they are likely to die from something else at an older age. If they use a gun, uh, the case fatality raises about 85 or 90 percent. So, you know, you're not going to get that second chance. And so just think about this again. I mean, you, you, we've heard these great big numbers, but each of those numbers is, is a person, is a, is a you know, a, with, a, with a story and a life cut short and, left, and loved ones left behind, and it's a tragedy. And if you think about, let's say, a, a young... Um, temporarily distressed, uh, maybe intoxicated, a young person who's feeling hopeless and depressed, and they want to, to take their own life, um, if they have a gun, they are not going to get that second chance. And, and all of us, I think, are no more than maybe one or two degrees of separation away from a story like this. I have two in my family, uh, both ends of the lifespan, a, a, co a college freshman, 19-year-old cousin who ended her life with a gun, and a granddad on my mom's, uh, on my wife's side of the family. So you know this is this is complicated, and when when we when we think about the problem, uh, it would be tempting you know to do what our peer countries do and say let's broadly limit legal access to handguns. You know the idea that everybody should have the right to have a handgun um, that's just too dangerous. Uh, uh, so let's make exceptions where we can, but let's you know broadly we, that's kind of off the table. But what we can do is try to think about better ways. Um, to focus the restrictions on risk. Now, I think, with respect to mental illness, the criteria that we have, that we've inherited from the 1968 Gun Control Act that was passed the year that uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And, and Senator Bobby Kennedy were assassinated with firearms, the problem with those criteria is that they are both uh, too broad and too narrow at the same time. They're under-inclusive and they're over-inclusive. Now, with respect to mental illness, um, what we have there are two prongs. You're probably familiar with this, um, they, and this is encoded in federal regulations. There is in anybody who has been committed to a mental institution. The idea there is, you know, that's particularly it, after civil commitment uh, statutes were reformed. Really, that's about dangerousness to be committed. So maybe that should map onto it. And there's also been some due process for the deprivation of liberty involved in civil commitment proceedings with a, with a judicial hearing and oppor opportunity to be represented by a lawyer. And so there's that. 
Um, so that, that confers, unless you have had your gun rights restored, um, a, a, what can amount to a permanent deprivation of gun rights. Then there is this second phrase that's kind of infelicitous and it's, it's archaic. It's adjudicated as a mental defective. And that doesn't really mean anything clinically. What it means legally is that there has been a legal authority that has determined uh, that uh, a person is dangerous or, or uh, incompetent to manage their own affairs due to mental illness or in a criminal matter that they have been found incompetent to stand trial or not guilty by reason of insanity. Now, what that means is that, that the federal law that prohibits firearms from people is embedded in what states do, because state law is where civil commitment statutes reside and where things like uh, guardianship statutes reside. And those are, um, you know, uh, not to make a pun here, but those laws are, uh, the states are all over the map, literally, on this. Because, um, you, you know, some states, you know, maybe 5% uh, of the people with serious mental illnesses in the public behavioral health system have a history of a gun disqualifying mental health adjudication. In a neighboring state, it might be 90%, maybe because they use civil commitment as a way to transport pe a person from a, from a local uh, emergency department to the state regional mental hospital. So you could, you could lose your gun rights, the same person in one state, um, and not in the next state. In another state, um, the, the um, reporting authority, the, 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 the way that these records get into the National Instant Criminal Background Check system, so someone would have a background check, is that the state mental health system reports those records. They only know about the records of the people who have been committed in their own state licensed and operated facilities. Now, meanwhile, maybe the system's been privatized. Lots of people are getting involuntarily committed in private facilities. The state agency doesn't know about that. So the same person, talk about disparities, who is poor on Medicaid and gets admitted to the state mental hospital and gets committed and loses his gun rights, the same person, same disorder, who might have insurance as a you know, bank vice president with bipolar disorder, and he gets admitted to a private hospital, that record might not go to the background check system. So there are all these kinds of disparities. Um, the other problem with, with this, from a point of view of its effectiveness in public health, is, you know, we've heard we have, uh, you know, we live in a country that celebrates guns, and the, the guns is, are embedded in our culture and our history, and we also have a heck of a lot of them, 310 million firearms in private hands, which is about 97 guns per 100 people. That doesn't mean every single person has a gun, but there are lots of guns out there, particularly in some states. So if we focus all of our attention on saying, well, let's get good criteria and have a good background check, um, you know, when someone tries to buy a gun from a federally licensed uh, retailer, and meanwhile, a person has 10 guns at home already, that might not be a deterrent. Um, so, you know, I think I'm part of this group that's trying to think about ways to, um, it's called the, the, the Consortium for Risk-Based Firearms Policy. You know, and, and in my view, I mean, this is vastly oversimplifying things, but I, it seems to me that, that you know, in the you know, post-Heller policy period, Gun control is really less about gun control. It's more about people control, trying to figure out who are, da who are the dangerous people you know, that shouldn't have guns. That's hard to do, as I've said. But we have some ideas. Um, with respect to mental illness, for example, the policy proposal would be, um, look at all the people who are brought in in the middle of a mental health crisis and um, just are there for a short-term hold, maybe 72 hours, and then they're discharged. Uh, they don't, it doesn't progress to a full judicially uh, 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 sufficient uh, in commitment hearing with a lawyer and all that, so a person doesn't lose their gun rights. But the system knows that that person is in a mental health crisis. Those uh, I incidents could be used to disqualify people from guns, at least temporarily. What about violent misdemeanors? In many states, violent misdemeanors don't lose their gun rights. And uh, what about people who are subject to a temporary uh, domestic violence order of protection? In the period, you know, it might be an ex parte order, but before it becomes permanent. Some states allow the suspected the perpetrator of domestic or independent partner violence to keep his gun at that time. That's a high-risk period. That could be used as a prohibitor. What about people who have multiple DUIs or DWIs? We know that problematic alcohol use is uh, correlated with uh, violence. So those kinds of things could be used as prohibitors. And what about um, taking, uh, you know, having, encouraging states to pass laws that you might call preemptive risk-based gun removal laws. So someone who doesn't necessarily fall into the one of these prohibited categories, but family members, other people know that they are at risk of harming others or themselves, put a legal tool in the hands of, uh, of you know, family and law enforcement, get a judge to weigh in and issue a civil order to remove guns from people in, that, in those circumstances. And in this two states that where this has been already tried and we're doing a research project there, Connecticut and Indiana, 
They're used most often for suicide concerns. And uh, we have some evidence now that this actually uh, is effective in, in uh, preventing suicides. Where the, law, where the, the restrictions are um, really kind of under-inclusive is there are lots of people out there who have what you could call impulsive, angry behavior. These are the kinds of people who, when they get angry, they break and smash things, and they get into fights and have access to guns. About 9% of the adults in this country have some kind of pathological anger traits and have access to firearms at home, and about 1.5% are carrying a gun around with them and have these impulsive, angry behavior traits. Do these people have mental illness? Well, they do meet criteria in our study for some kinds of psychopathology, like personality disorders and alcohol problems, but they don't have the kinds of disorders that are going to disqualify them by getting them involuntarily committed. Only 10% of them have ever been in a hospital for treatment with a, for a mental health problem. You remember the incident here where the three Muslim students were shot by Craig Stephen Hicks. That's kind of a, you know, he might be the poster person for this because he had all these guns at home. People knew he was angry. People were concerned about him. California has just enacted, or this past year, the Gun Violence Restraining Order, which uh, is the, uh, the successor to this law in Connecticut and Indiana. That was enacted in, after, in the aftermath of the Elliot Roger shooting in Isla Vista. If you recall this story, this, man, this young man's family knew he was emotionally disturbed. They called the police to pay a social welfare visit, and he didn't meet the criteria to be detained under California's 5150 involuntary uh, uh, commitment law. So he was allowed to stay there. But with the gun violence restraining order, um, th th this would have been a case where his firearms, he had lots of guns, could have been removed. Um, so, you know, we are, we're, our group is involved in lots of research projects, you know, and I, th I think there are decisions that have to be made uh, by, by legal professionals, by, uh, you know, judicial officers. Sometimes there are laws that are enacted. It would be great if we had all the research evidence there to make the best laws and the, and the most effective policies. We don't necessarily. But, you know, this is a long-term process. It's a conversation, I think, between the law and uh, research. Um, and, you know, we're never going to live in a world where we don't have, uh, you know, risky, uh, dangerous people. Uh, I don't think we should have to live in a world, um, notwithstanding the Second Amendment and how it's been interpreted, uh, where people like that at times of high risk have uh, such easy access to such an efficient killing technology. And I think if we did a lot of these things and also tried to get upstream and focus on some of the social determinants of violence, have fewer, you know, uh, healthier communities with fewer kids exposed to trauma who grow up to be perpetrators, for example, and maybe take some of all the money we're spending in, you know, mass incarceration and interdiction of drugs and make substance abuse treatment more available to people, that might uh, re prevent violence. I think we, you know, one day w would, would be able to live in a less, uh, less violent society. Uh, and I hope we can. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, the risk of speaking after three smart professors is twofold. Number one, a lot of good things are already have going to be been said, and number two, you'll have very little time left. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm going to talk about good guns and bad guns, but before I do that, I want to just get a sense of the audience, folks who are willing by show of hands, who here would say, uh, I'm generally in support of more gun control? Okay, and then who here would say, I'm generally in support of a robust Second Amendment right to bear arms? Okay, so there might be some people who voted for both of those things, and that's fine, but it's a, it just gives me a good sense of who the crowd is. So good guns and bad guns. Um, it's kind of a tongue-in-cheek title, right? Some people will say there's, there's no such thing as a good gun, and I'm guessing we probably have some of those people in this room from the show of hands that we had. And then some would say that guns are like dogs, right? There's, there's no bad guns, only bad owners. Um, I think there's some, a lot of people are maybe in some kind of a middle ground, right? We've, we've been hearing about how the Second Amendment is nuanced, that it provides a right, but it's not an unlimited right, that there's room maybe for research-based analysis about what types of people or maybe what types of weapons are most likely to be dangerous. Uh, and so I think a lot of people would say, uh, I support private ownership of some firearms, but there's some that I don't support. And uh, so I'm going to confine my remarks to two categories of weapons. One is the um, most unsupported category of weapons, and that's assault weapons and high-capacity magazines. Uh, and one is sort of an emerging category of uh, potentially favored weapons, which are so-called smart guns. So let me start with assault weapons and high-capacity magazines. Um, what are we talking about? Assault weapons are semi-automatic rifles. One pull of the trigger fires one bullet that uh, have certain military-style features, a pistol grip or uh, a, a bayonet mount or things like that. Whether those are highly functional is a matter of dispute and something that we'll return to, but they at least convey a militaristic appearance uh, 
And so the federal government from 1994 to 2004 banned private ownership of assault weapons, and a number of states now have bans of assault weapons in some localities as well. High capacity magazines, the magazine is the thing that you insert into the gun that holds the bullets. A high capacity magazine was defined by federal law and by many state laws as a magazine that holds more than 10 bullets. Other cutoffs are obviously possible. Um, Regulation of those types of weapons and those types of magazines is obviously politically contentious with people who support more regulation saying these are great tools for mass shootings and they're not useful for self-defense and folks who support uh, the access to such weapons saying these don't function any differently than any other gun and they're useful for sporting purposes and you take those away. It's the first step towards taking away all sorts of other firearms rights. Um, what I wanted to talk about is the legal status of those bans in a post-Heller world. So seven states and the District of Columbia currently have state-level uh, assault weapons and high-capacity magazine bans. Colorado has a high-capacity magazine ban, uh, but no state-level assault weapons ban. And then some municipalities in states that allow municipal regulation of firearms have assault weapons bans or high-capacity magazine bans. And that spawned a lot of interesting litigation. Uh, Professor Bloker was talking about how um, Heller is this kind of more nuanced maybe than it first appears. The, the key takeaway ho holding perhaps uh, on this is the Second Amendment does not protect those weapons not typically possessed by law-abiding citizens for lawful purposes, such as short-barreled shotguns. Uh, by contrast, it does protect weapons that are in quote-unquote common use. And so uh, we have this sort of question about our assault weapons, the type of weapons that Heller would allow us to prohibit because of their militaristic nature, or because they're incredibly commonly owned, maybe 20% of all long guns in the United States are uh, assault weapons under the federal and state definitions. Are they the types of weapons that are in common use? And so Heller says that we can't prohibit them. Well, no surprise, there's been lots of litigation about this. And the federal circuit courts are now, as of a couple weeks ago, split on the issue three to one in favor of upholding assault weapons bans. That's a slight oversimplification, but it'll work for now. Each of those cases has involved a majority and a dissent. So if you're counting judges at the federal circuit court level, it's seven to five in favor of upholding assault weapons bans. So I think it's a pretty close question. The most recent case and the mo one most pertinent to us is uh, one that was decided by the Fourth Circuit. Obviously, North Carolina is a part of the Fourth Circuit, so that's the law here, and it concerned a Maryland assault weapon and high-capacity mm -hmm. magazine ban. The Fourth Circuit, in its uh, opinion, said that that uh, regulation intrudes on the core of the Second Amendment right because it's a complete prohibition of an entire class of weapons that law-abiding people commonly own for self-defense and other purposes. Uh, it described the uh, AR-15 as the most popular by far type of rifle in the United States, which I think sales data supports, and rejected the idea that they're unusual and dangerous weapons within the meaning of that term uh, in Heller. So the court said strict scrutiny applies to the assault weapons ban. And so technically, it remanded the case to district court and said the district court needs to apply strict scrutiny in the first instance. But we know from our 1L con law class that uh, scrutiny that is strict in theory is fatal in fact, and everything in the Fourth Circuit's opinion would lead you to believe that whatever the district court does, the Fourth Circuit is going to rule that the assault weapons ban is no good. That, I said, is at odds with some previous decisions, one from the Second Circuit concerning the New York and Connecticut assault weapons bans enacted after the Newtown shooting, uh, a Seventh Circuit case concerning a municipal assault weapons ban, and then one of the many, many gun rights cases captioned Heller versus District of Columbia. This guy, Joseph Heller, is like a not in a nonstop litigation binge against D.C.'s various gun regulations. One of those was a challenge to an assault weapons ban. All those cases um, turned out in favor of uh, upholding the ban. So just a couple of thoughts from my, my point of view about that legal landscape. Number one, Supreme Court review seems inevitable given the circuit split and how important the issue is, how high profile it is. Right now might not be the best time for the court to do that because we don't have enough members to assure us of a decision. Uh, and these gun rights cases have been contentious at the Supreme Court before, so maybe let's wait until we have nine. Folks who think um, that it's pretty important who replaces Justice Scalia, I think they're, you're probably right as it comes to the outcome of this case. The second thought is about this level of scrutiny business. Heller didn't give us a level of scrutiny that would apply to gun regulations. And as Professor Bloker noted, the lower courts have adopted this, to my mind, kind of awkward two-step test where we have to figure out how serious the issue is, then we apply a level of scrutiny. It seems a little bit backwards to me. Um, but in any event, 
um, several of the opinions that have upheld these assault weapons ban have done so applying intermediate scrutiny and have kind of suggested, look, this issue with assault weapons, it isn't as important as the issue with handguns in the original Heller case. Handguns in Heller were described as sort of the quintessential weapon of self-defense, and so assault weapons, that they're not as essential. Maybe, you know, maybe, but maybe not. In fact, if you think about this sort of balancing of the government's interest and the individual interest, handguns are overwhelmingly the most popular type of firearm that's used in criminal activity. Assault weapons are hardly ever used in criminal activity. When they are, it's often in a high-profile mass shooting, so uh, that's going to come into the ledger somewhere. But um, I think if you're balancing these these interests that the government has and the individual has, it's not that easy, actually, to say that we should scrutinize assault weapons bans more closely than we ought to scrutinize handgun bans, because in a lot of sort of epidemiological ways, handguns are the more dangerous type of weapon there. And then my third thought about this is that the courts have, that have decided these cases so far have generally treated assault weapons bans and high-capacity magazine bans as sort of one and the same, all part and parcel. But I'm not sure that those shouldn't be disambiguated, because I think there's um, a, a, the high-capacity magazine issue, I think, has a clearer connection to the number of shots that can be fired. It is a substantive mechanical feature of the weapon that arguably facilitates mass shootings. There's a pretty strong argument that assault weapons bans target non-functional cosmetic aspects of a rifle. It's not the bayonet mount that's going to kill anybody, right? So whether the gun has the bayonet mount or not is kind of immaterial to the functionality. The functionality of the assault weapon is pretty much the same as any semi-automatic weapon. So take off the pistol grip and the bayonet mount and shoot somebody with the weapon, and it will kill you just as dead. So I'm not sure that the, the assault weapon and, and the high-capacity magazine, those issues are precisely the same, even though they've been treated kind of that way. I will truncate my remarks in the interest of time on smart guns. The smart guns issue in general is this. Everybody's got a smartphone. It's got a passcode so that only you can access it. Can we do something like that for guns, a fingerprint reader, uh, some kind of proximity thing to my watch that enables the gun to work? That, that idea would address two issues with respect to guns. One of them is the risk of stolen guns being used in crime. The other one is the risk of small children finding guns around the house and shooting themselves with it. So that's the impetus behind smart guns. The reason why there are no smart guns on the market is absolutely fascinating, and it's a story of the road to hell being paved with good intentions. New Jersey passed a law some years ago that said, as soon as smart guns are available for commercial sale anywhere in the country, within three years after that, the only guns you can get in New Jersey are smart guns. The effect of that has been that any time a gun dealer has said, I think I'll start selling one of these smart guns, they have been deluged with gun rights activists who said, you are disarming New Jersey. <laughs> And they've all backed down under the pressure. So nobody will sell smart guns. That's how it stands now. And New Jersey is thinking about repealing its law because it's proven to be completely counterproductive to, to the goal of it. It raises this interesting legal issue, which is kind of will be my closing thought. There's obviously some implementation issues around New Jersey's law. But would it be constitutional to have a requirement that all guns must be smart guns? And I think there's kind of two lenses to view that question through. One of them is... Um, hey, that's a safety feature like an airbag in a car. It doesn't affect the kind of basic function of the car. You can still drive the car. You can still use your gun for self-defense. So it's kind of outside this core of the Second Amendment. It's kind of a, a, a simple add-on to technology that we already have, so no big deal. We could require it. The other lens to view that question through, though, is it would be the equivalent of a complete ban of every firearm currently sold or owned in the United States. And if you view it through that lens, it's a pretty significant intrusion on Second Amendment rights. So my sort of thinking about that is if the New Jersey provision were challenged instead of just being repealed, which I think is what's going to happen, um, I think it would be unlikely at this point to survive Second Amendment analysis because of the burden that in the real world it would impose on law-abiding gun owners. If the technology matures and the market matures to the point where these guns are widely available, they are recognized alternatives, they've been proven to work, they're not buggy, they, you know, whatever, um, I think in that scenario the Second Amendment calculus actually might shift, but I think we're a long way from that point. So those are my comments on guns good and bad. And I'll turn it back over to Professor Bloker to moderate whatever discussion we're going to have. I think I will, I will pass on and yield, um, as Professor Welty has generously done, yield the time to questions. If anybody has questions or comments. If you were to find out through a 
a sociological study that uh, a majority of the population is, is simply for whatever uh, purpose they as individuals, a majority of the population is individually incapable of like exercising the right safely. Like they have, they have anger issues, they have some other sort of issue. What, what do you think that would, what, if there were a study like that, what would it change the debate? How would it affect the debate? Or not a majority, but even a very substantial po percentage of population. Well, you know that that's a the question really is uh, I guess how high does does the risk have to be? What we do when we think about risk, there are two components of it. One is how likely the bad event is to, to happen, and number two is how bad would it be if it did. So you know if if the um, uh, and I think that's why um, you know we're maybe likely to make decisions um, that even. Um, Events that are not that likely, you know, if the if the consequence is catastrophic, then that uh, you know that should be uh, limited. But you know, in the in the in the case we started with here, D.C. versus Heller, there was a very I think compelling study showing that the um, that the uh, licensing law that effectively banned handguns in D.C. for a period of time, like two decades in the 1960s and 70s, that um, that actually saved about 42 lives per year. Uh, and I think that should be the headline, but the headline, of course, is D.C. versus Heller, because that evidence didn't really matter. I mean, others can comment on that, but, um, you know, there, there is that. Uh, um, some, some people actually value the, the, the right more than, the, uh, more than they uh, uh, account for the risk. So uh, I think that your hypothetical isn't so hypothetical, right, because um, there's a cutoff, there's an age cutoff for possession of firearms. That's a substantial portion of the population who otherwise you might say would have some kind of self-defense right, right? Whether it's at school, I mean, the 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 the, the proposition is that uh, even though you know a 12-year-old or 11-year-old or 8-year-old uh, is at risk at school of uh, being harmed, they still don't have a right to actually bear an arm uh, to protect themselves. So. Uh, one answer to it is, yeah, that's exactly what we have now, and there is a kind of constitutionally encoded notion um, that um, uh, that there's a there's some sort of age requirement. Now, how that gets articulated, whether it's a question about, you know, what would the founders have thought a virtuous society would be, or whether we are using some kind of um, you know criminological data, um, is is um, is a harder issue to, to suss out, but we already sort of have a kind of risk, uh, a risk assessment based uh, on a heuristic, which is age. My two thoughts about that would be, number one, um, it's an interesting hypothetical, but with the idea of some kind of conclusive sociological study in anything to do with firearms is essentially impossible, right? That debate is so contentious and robust. But number two, I, I think a possible analogy would be, what if we had a study that said uh, a majority or a substantial minority of people were unable to operate an automobile safely? Um, what effect would that have? Well, I think it would change the regulations we had around cars, but it's hard for me to imagine that that would mean we've abolished all cars. But you could stop life. All oh, right, you're not going to pass the test. You don't get the license. Yeah, easily is easier said than done. But I think you're you're right. I mean, we kind of get to this question that we were talking about before about what are the who are the people that we're going to allow to have guns and not. And I think the social science research can be really important there. Uh, what do you guys think uh, the future will look like now with Obama's executive order and then Scalia's passing and this election coming up? I pick up with that one, because um, <clears throat> Professor Welty raised this possibility as well about um, whether the court will take another case, for example, and then what would happen if that happened after Scalia is replaced? Presumably, he's a place he's replaced by the current president. Um, I mean, just a background on that is that the court has rejected or declined to accept dozens and dozens and dozens of Second Amendment cases by now to the immense frustration, I would say, of the gun rights community, um, uh, good cases, cases that involved at least arguable splits. Um, and the only people on the court who seem to be bothered by this are Justice, were Justice Scalia and Justice Thomas, who twice published dissents from denial of cert, which, as you guys probably know, is a pretty rare thing. 
And their argument was the lower courts are not respecting Heller. They're not following what we told them to do. This is not, they're not really effectuating the right. Now, apparently, the other people in the majority of Heller and McDonald did not agree with that because they're the only two people who were able to, um, they're the only two justices who signed on to those opinions. And as you know, it only takes four to grant cert, and they couldn't get even one more vote out of the Kennedy and, um, uh, uh, well, Kennedy would be the most likely, maybe, Kennedy, Roberts, or Alito group. Um, so, you know, of the current, you know, of the four remaining of that group, I'm not sure that there's an appetite um, uh, uh, to, uh, to grant. Um, there, there's a couple of reasons for this in my view. One is that if you look out at the landscape of what the gun laws are that are out there to challenge, there frankly just aren't that many super strict gun laws left. Um, Heller and McDonald struck down the only two municipal handgun bans in the country, which was in Washington and in Chicago. If you look at the federal laws, they're frankly just not that strict. I think they would satisfy basically any level of scrutiny if they were to be applied. Maybe an as-applied challenge to a felon ban, um, a person who's you know been adjudicated mentally defective but years down the road has proved themselves not to be might succeed on an as-applied challenge, but I just don't see a lot of laws out there that make for good cases. If a case were to come up, I think it would be on a split, either on the methodology or on the substance, and Professor Welty mentioned um, one that involves both methodology and substance. One is that courts are divided a little bit on this strict versus intermediate scrutiny kind of a question. A court, the, the Supreme Court might take a case up to resolve that. On the substance, there's really not that many splits. The assault weapons case from the Fourth Circuit recently could be one, although that, if it's end banked, which I would suspect it will be, I think will go the other way. Um, that's probably what's going to happen in the Ninth Circuit's recent case on public carrying. On substance, the issue that's most likely to go up, I think, is not assault weapon bans, which I agree with Professor Welty, you just get too much attention. This is not actually, as a policy matter, what we should be focusing on. But probably um, what are known as good cause restrictions, which are restrictions that exist in probably seven or eight states which require you to show some reason before you can get a license to carry a gun in public. Those have been challenged, um, and depending on how things shake out, we could have a split on whether those are constitutional, split between the Ninth Circuit and the D.C. Circuit. So far, every court of appeals that has ruled on those has also upheld them because the vast majority of things have been upheld. Then you might get a result. Will Heller be overturned? I don't know. My view is probably not, and gun control advocates shouldn't care that much because it gives tons of room for the kind of reasonable regulations that people say they want. And so this should not, in my view, be a particularly high priority for people who care, um, as I do, about reasonable gun control. But filibustered for too long there. I just add one thing to that. I mean, th there's this idea that, you know, since the uh, Sandy Hook Elementary School shooting, um, there was great concern that uh, things would change, uh, there would be um, some action, uh, and that nothing has happened. And actually, that's not true. I mean, w w whatever might be happening uh, on the landscape of the federal courts and legislation at the federal level, uh, the fact is that um, almost half the people in this country now live in a state with stronger, stricter gun laws than they had in 2013. Um, there's great variability across states in the strength of gun laws, and there is a correlation between the strength of gun laws, the restrictiveness of gun laws, and uh, the firearm fatality rate. Um, and, you know, that's not necessarily a causal uh, connection. Um, uh, but there's a lot of action that, that is happening, and I've mentioned some of it, um, you know, in my remarks about the gun violence restraining order, um, that so far has, has gone forward uh, w without uh, seemingly uh, running up against uh, uh, problems with the Second Amendment. On that note, it looks like we can end at exactly 1.30. Thank you all for coming. If there's more questions, we're happy to talk afterwards. Thank you very much.